Thanks for coming around this morning, everyone. Um, yeah, my intention today is uh, to go over the new CUA guidelines uh, with respect to some of the new evidence that's uh, come out within the last uh, couple of years. And these guidelines are actually just published this month today uh, in the uh, Canadian Journal of Urology. Um, <clears throat> so today's objectives will be uh, provide an overview of the new CUA guidelines. And uh, I'll discuss the recent highlights in the literature uh, leading up to uh, changes in these guidelines and discuss how they uh, may change management uh, on our perspective uh, for uh, ureteral stones. So <clears throat> if we look at the ureteral stone patients in its entirety, and we know uh, that this is extremely common disease, um, Romello in 2000 did an epidemiological study and suggested that up to 5 to 10% of the population suffers from this uh, particular disease. And in the U.S. in 2000, over 2 million outpatient visits were recorded um, and this has increased over the course of six years, from 1994 to 2000, by 40%. Um, <clears throat> when you do a cost analysis, they estimate that in the U.S. in 2006, that the annual cost of stone disease was over $10 billion. So it's a pretty significant uh, disease in terms of uh, morbidity to the patient and uh, cost to the system. Um, of course, we have to adjust these numbers for Canada, but we could probably estimate it at about one-tenth of that. Uh, with respect to this, it uh, thus becomes necessary to create a cohesive, cohesive clinical guideline to help standardize care, uh, maximizing um, uh, treatment efficacy for the patient while minimizing morbidity. Just in uh, quick background on the natural history of stone disease, <clears throat> we know that uh, uh, stones are thought to form with a uh, supersaturated crystalline nidus, and these can either pop down into uh, from the parenchyma into the collecting system and down into the ureter, uh, which can either pass asymptomatically, being small enough to pass through the intraluminal diameter of the ureter, or they can get lodged, create ureteral con uh, contractions causing pain and back pressure into the pelvic uh, or pilocalocele system, inducing the classic renal colic. Now, <clears throat> fortunately for our patients, we have a variety of different options to treat these stones. <clears throat> we can either observe them for spontaneous passage. We can try a course of medical expulsion therapy. We can uh, have these patients undergo extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy or treat them with flexible or semi-rigid ureteroscope or ureteroscopy. For the, some of our larger stones, we can do a PERC or, which is becoming less frequent now uh, with the rise of endourology. Uh, we can actually do open surgery on these patients to relieve them of their stone burden. <clears throat> when we design or when we start thinking about intervention and treatment, we have to consider uh, four major factors. Uh, and these can be, or four broad categories, and these can be subdivided into um, things that we need to think about are things like uh, stone factors, where the stone is located, the size of the stone, the composition uh, that makes up the stone and the presence of duration of obstruction. Clinical factors being uh, how badly the patient is suffering from these symptoms. Uh, the expectations of the patient in terms of their uh, relief from these symptoms and their stone. Whether or not there's an uh, overlying infection and uh, certainly clinical factors associated with the patient itself, such as obesity, coagulopathy, hypertension and uh, in special cases of solitary kidneys and obstruction. With respect to anatomic factors, we can think about things like uh, that are going to change uh, decision making uh, factors such as a horseshoe kidney, regional pelvic junction obstructions, or renal atopia. <clears throat> and even though we're pretty blessed in the stone center here, um, you know, other places that don't have access to all of these different techniques, uh, we need, they need to think about uh, technical factors such as available equipment. Um, the expertise in using that equipment and the cost is uh, uh, surrounding the intervention, which is an important consideration in today's uh, economic uh, or medical economic state. But when we consider all of these factors, our goal still remains that we must minimize the morbidity to the patient when we introduce a treatment, but maximize the therapeutic benefit of that treatment. <coughs> Narrowing down today a little bit further, we'll talk about uh, conservative management and the role of medical expulsion therapy and how that's potentially changed over the last uh, year or so. Um, and then look at active interventions with either shockwave lithotripsy or ureteroscopy. 
and then we'll go over some of the evidence suggesting uh, differences in how we can modulate how we do shockwave therapy or ureteroscopy and the associated uh, successes or increases in successes of making these patients stone free. So we'll first start with conservative management. <clears throat> this is the effectively the art of doing nothing. Um, potentially these are uh, patients that come in uh, and they have minimal stone burden. Um, but a common scenario that us residents get is, say for example, it's a Thursday afternoon, it's 4.50 p.m., the stone center is now closed and the pager goes off, it's emerged. And <laughs> we return the page and of course we get the unit clerk saying, waterworks, <laughs> and uh, they say, let me send you over to the eMERGE doc. And he comes with a scenario, and it's a 60-year-old male. He's a 5-millimeter distal right ureteric stone on CT. He's got a little bit of swelling in his kidney. There's blood in his urine. No fever, and white blood cell count is normal. Creatinine's mildly elevated. But he's got some pain, but it's settling now. And he asks us if we can get him in for an S wall today. Now, what do we do with this particular patient? Well, there's a good argument to actually just watch these patients. And <clears throat> this is based off of uh, evidence from uh, 2007 in which the AUA and the European uh, uh, Urologic Association uh, combined to create uh, the ureteral uh, stone guidelines. And in their guidelines, they actually conducted a meta-analysis in which they looked at 224 patients, observing these patients for uh, spontaneous stone passage. Now they subdivided the patients and found that uh, stones that were five millimeters or less had an actual like, acceptable passage rate of approximately 68%. And this decreased as the stone uh, grew larger, decreasing to 47% for stones over five to 10 millimeters. Now other studies from late 90s, early 2000s have shown uh, stone passage rates of over 90% for stones that are less than five millimeters or uh, approximately two to four millimeters. But this is also associated with uh, a time to stone passage, which may take up to 40 days. And that's an important consideration when talking to a patient that this may uh, be an extended period of time which we have to watch the stone. <coughs> so with respect to the first guideline that's solicited in the, the, uh, the new publication, <coughs> based on this data, it's probably appropriate actually to um, give these patients with a five millimeter stone in the distal ureter uh, a chance of spontaneous passage, <clears throat> as it seems to be over 90%. Um, <clears throat> this is with the caveat that there are no infectious symptoms and the patient's actually on board for this particular uh, course. Um, and additionally, no threat to renal function. The stones that are greater than five millimeters are less likely to pass spontaneously and the patient should be counseled about treatment options. So we get back on the phone with the uh, eMERGE doc and say, well, let's do a trial of spontaneous passage. <clears throat> we can treat his pain adequately, make sure he's well hydrated, um, and then maybe even try and put him on Flomax to see if we can uh, help this stone along. And the eMERGE doc comes back and says, Flomax? I didn't even know we were still using that. I thought I just read a paper that, uh, you know, didn't show any effect. Um, <clears throat> and we'll get into this paper, but I thought it, we'd do a quick aside on um, <clears throat> the role of alpha receptors in the ureter. Uh, just as a background before we discuss the, uh, this new paper. Now, alpha adrenergic receptors are <clears throat> uh, belong to a group of G protein coupled receptors. And they mediate uh, in an autonomic innervation throughout uh, most of the organ systems in the body. And these are present on smooth muscle. And they act to allow uh, contraction and uh, relaxation of smooth muscle and coordinate their action um, under, the, uh, under uh, receptor activation. And in a study by uh, Sigala in 2005, actually did uh, an interesting an interesting uh, study in which they looked at uh, receptor expression at different levels of human ureter. So these are RT-PCR gels, uh, gel electrophoresis, for uh, expression profiles of alpha-1 alpha, or alpha-1 alpha, 
alpha 1 beta and alpha 1 uh, delta, or 1D. And you can see in the proximal, medial, and distal ureter that all three are expressed. Now this is in a quantitative PCR, but uh, with you can kind of eyeball this and see expression levels actually increase um, going down the distal ureter and showing that uh, alpha-1 D receptors are more prevalent in the distal ureter itself. Now they also did um, ligand binding studies, <clears throat> which are actually were able, they were able to uh, quantify the amount of receptor expression and do show that there is a higher receptor expression in the distal ureter of the alpha-1 delta, or alpha-1 D receptors. Um, <clears throat> now these receptors act uh, coordinated, or in a coordinated fashion uh, to carry out ureteral peristalsis. <clears throat> if we look at the actual mechanisms of peristalsis itself, and this is a, uh, a schematic uh, just on the left, um, <clears throat> peristalsis itself is a response to uh, some kind of bolus, uh, in this case in the ureter being urine. Uh, in which there's a coordinated relaxation of the distal aspect of the bolus and a coordinated contraction in the proximal aspect. Now, <clears throat> uh, this happens throughout the course of the ureter, and it's governed by uh, smooth muscle fibers that are oriented longitudinally, circumferentially, and in a spiral configuration. And these allow that bolus of urine to actually pass down through the ureter. Now, in the <clears throat> without uh, direct innervation itself, the ureter does have an inherent contractile, uh, contractile activity, but this is tuned by the autonomic system through the alpha and beta receptors. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, a study taken from uh, the Campbell's chapter, actually, on this, and shows that uh, there's a phenomenon known as creep within the ureter itself that uh, uh, is effectively uh, that when, a, when the ureter has a pressure challenge within it, that it actually increases in both length and diameter, effectively relaxing. And you can see this in, in vivo, looking at uh, D over DO, which is uh, length and uh, diameter, that inhibiting uh, norepinephrine release uh, through uh, a drug reserpine will actually uh, increase this length and diameter up here, suggesting that these uh, receptors play an active role in tone of the ureter. <clears throat> in 2015 of this year, uh, it's an interesting study by uh, Roshani, which took a uh, anesthetized pig and placed an anti-grade nephrostomy tube with a ureteral catheter that could measure uh, both pressure and peristalsis. And then they subjected this pig to a variety of different pharmaceutical agents, um, name, <coughs> namely isoprenaline, uh, which is a beta agonist, propranolol, which is a beta blocker, uh, phenylephrin, which is an alpha agonist, and, and doxazosin, urapidil, and uh, L nitro or N nitro L arginine, and they were able to measure uh, intraureteral pressures in response to these pharmaceutical agents. Now, the <clears throat> when looking at uh, uh, intramural ureteric pre uh, ureteric pressures, we can see that when you add the beta agonist uh, isoprenaline, we get a actually a drastic drop within the intramural pressure itself, uh, suggesting that that uh, beta agonist tone, or that the, uh, the beta receptor actually uh, produces a tone uh, in its uh, relaxed state. Whereas if you have an alpha agonist, such as uh, doxazosin, we get a, again, we get a decrease uh, in the intramural uh, ureteric pressures. But when we look at ureteric peristalsis, uh, we show no difference with doxazosin, suggesting that the alpha receptor, uh, specifically from the alpha receptor 1, 
<coughs> doesn't play a role in uh, the actual peristalsis of the ureter itself. Uh, <coughs> compiling the results of this study suggested that uh, uh, two big, uh, or I, three, three big uh, things came out of this study, which is that beta stimulation induces a relaxation of the ureter, whereas beta blockade uh, with propranolol actually increased the ureteral pressure. And doxazosin, even though it had no effect on peristalsis, was uh, effective in actually decreasing the intraureteral pressure itself. Potentially uh, forming the, this is, uh, this would uh, kind of form the, the basic science foundation of uh, the argument to use alpha blockers to decrease that intraureteral pressure and hopefully allow that <coughs> stone to pass down that ureter. Which brings us to our uh, discussion of medical expulsion therapy. <coughs> no. <coughs> um, <coughs> medical expulsion therapy is the use of an alpha-1 adrenergic adenoceptor blocker uh, to help facilitate stone passage. And this is based off of, um, again, the AUA-EUA guidelines of 2007, uh, in which they looked at, uh, or they conducted a meta-analysis looked at uh, comparing alpha blockers to controls and found that significantly more patients had uh, passed their stones while on the alpha blocker. In fact, over 29% uh, saw an increase in uh, stone passage rates while on uh, an alpha blocker. Uh, Cochrane, uh, or uh, sorry, Camp Schroer in 2014 um, with his group uh, also uh, conducted a Cochrane uh, meta-analysis in which they uh, compiled 32 studies uh, of approximately 5,800 patients and saw that there were higher stone-free rates uh, within the alpha blocker group, a shorter uh, time to stone expulsion, <clears throat> and a decreased number of pain episodes, analgesic requirements, and hospitalizations uh, while patients were on an alpha blocker. Now these studies, both of these studies, uh, as was noted in the 2007 guidelines, uh, suggested they were, they had wide uh, heterogeneity, which is unfortunately um, kind of a side effect of doing a meta-analysis in the first place. But <clears throat> they did, in fact, offer the uh, option to suggest that we should be conducting a randomized controlled trial in which factors are controlled for with a homogenous group of uh, patients and which we could look at uh, alpha receptor blocker uh, activity and uh, their response to uh, stone free rates or stone passage time. And that uh, challenge was taken up by this group, uh, Robert Picard's group. <coughs> now this is a uh, study that was conducted in the UK and it was a large uh, multi-center randomized placebo controlled uh, trial uh, looking at patients with stones that were under 10 millimeters in size. And <clears throat> they randomized patients to either receiving uh, 0.4 milligrams of tamsulosin, 30 milligrams of nifedipine, or a placebo, uh, and followed these patients along for uh, four weeks, and then again at uh, 12 weeks had a uh, phone intervention uh, discussion with the patient. Now these were powered, uh, this study was powered to detect a 20% difference in total passage rate. <clears throat> Their primary outcome was the proportion of patients that did not need further intervention for stone clearance within four weeks of randomization. <clears throat> and one of the things that they didn't do was actually radiographically confirmed that stones had passed at four weeks. Um, <clears throat> the uh, primary outcome measurements, uh, or sorry, the number of patients that went actually through the, the study was over a thousand patients were uh, interviewed at that four week junction for the primary outcome, um, with decreases uh, to only about half of those patients uh, uh, fulfilling the requirements at 12 weeks with the uh, phone survey study done by the study uh, organizers. Can we ask a question about that primary outcome? Is that 
appropriate to find the outcome? Well, the problem is when we're down the literature period that a lot of people come in and they say, I'm not having any pain anymore, and you do the imaging, the stone's still there. Right. We yes. see that all the time, and it's just the compensatory mechanisms of the kidney yeah. to deal with the obstruction. So why would they have chosen that endpoint? Yeah, it's a good point, <clears throat> and we'll we'll discuss that because they actually make a point in the uh, in the commentary of the paper of why they didn't actually do radiographic uh, investigations at four weeks. Um, <clears throat> what they did publish on though was that there were no difference between the four between the three groups <laughs> at four weeks. So stone passage rates were approximately eighty percent in the intervention groups, tamsulosin and nifedipine, and the non-intervention group was placebo. Um, <clears throat> this was kind of uh, was counterintuitive from a basic science perspective, and uh, what we had always thought was uh, we were doing to help our patients out with their stone passage rates, and it was a little bit of a, a kind of a shock to the system. The, the disingenuous call it stone passage rate for the Marcus comment. I mean, I think, I can say if you look to that primary outcome criteria, that's not the same as stone passage rate. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So they, it was only a um, a patient reported stone passage rate, or uh, no need for further intervention at four weeks. So it gets to that point. Whereas in the you know down at Eswell, you see radiographic evidence of stone being there, but they're not actually reporting any symptoms anymore. Yet their kidney is effectively desensed at the time, so they're not having uh, symptoms. Um, which is definitely a criticism of this study. Just looking at the actual numbers reported in the study, um, mean time to, pat to uh, reported stone passage was unchanged throughout the three groups, uh, being approximately 16 days. Uh, the number of days of pain medications being used was about 10 to 11 days and homogenous throughout the, same, throughout the three groups. And on the visual analog pain scale, all three groups were effectively the same. <coughs> the uh, publishers of the study further subdivided uh, the groupings down into a uh, division of gender, uh, stone size, and location in the ureter. Um, <coughs> again, reporting on this force plot, no uh, significant difference between any of these groupings. So, Kind of, we can kind of trick our eye into thinking that there might be a trend towards significance in stones that are over five millimeters, or uh, stones that are in the lower ureter itself. And this is a, a subdivided uh, or a subgrouping analysis of uh, medical expulsion therapy in total: so tamsulosin and nifedipine versus placebo. Or if you break it down to just tamsulosin versus placebo, again we see no significant difference. In the groupings and nifedipine as well, no significant difference. <coughs> the, the conclusions that the uh, study authors stated in this paper was that the number of patients that needed further treatment at four <coughs> weeks were the same of all three intervention groups, and that was approximately 20%. And this was effectively unchanged at 12 weeks. <coughs> they stated that. Uh, medical expulsion therapy did not reduce pain, did not quicken time to stone passage, or change the quality of life, which was measured on their uh, uh, phone interviews at 4 and 12 weeks. Um, we may offer that there is some help in larger distal stones, uh, but in subgroup analysis, there was no difference on the forest plots. <clears throat> and they actually suggested that in their definitive conclusion, that the precision of their results, ruling out any clinical meaningful benefit, suggests that further trials involving these agents for spontaneous stone passage rates will be futile. <laughs> Which is, I think it's quite a, uh, that's quite a statement that you can make at the end of a paper. That was in, that was in Lancet? That was in Lancet, yeah. This is yeah. a high impact group. Yeah. Um, which uh, I would have thought would have been more careful. <laughs> About their wording, yeah. In terms of matching uh, the robustness of the trial to its primary endpoint to the yeah. conclusions that the authors draw. Exactly. You can't refer to stone passage. Do they have a subgroup where they actually 
have, have the stone? No, unfortunately not. I think, yeah, I think that's one of the major criticisms of this paper is that we have, well, I mean, we shouldn't uh, be indicating that. They didn't report on, they didn't report on any imaging here. Um, I think they were planning on subsequently, because some of them did get imaging afterwards. So, yeah. A 20%. Yeah, so it was around uh, 250, I believe. But, but Mark, you would never leave a ureteral stone and just say, okay, you know, did you have any problems? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just Hope everything's need, going to be fine. Don't you guys think you need some imaging afterwards to make sure that it's not important? Yeah, that's pretty fine. And, and then, can you stop filtering? You'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, distal ureteral stones that are less than 10 millimeters in size, potentially over 5 millimeters in size. <coughs> now, when, we, when there is an actual intervent, uh, indication for intervention, <coughs> the next portion of the paper actually uh, took a look at the comparative out outcomes of URS versus extracorporeal shock wave. <coughs> now, this is effectively uh, lessons learned from the real estate industry, that it's all about stone location. And <coughs> in 2007, again, with the AUA-EUA uh, guidelines, they did a systematic review of stone free rates and looked at and stratified patients based on uh, stones within the distal versus the proximal ureter. And in 2007, it was found that there was no difference between <coughs> stone-free rates in extracorporeal shockwave and ureteroscopy in the distal ureter. However, in the proximal ureter, what was actually uh, counterintuitive to me is that stones that were less than 10 millimeters, there showed an <coughs> increased propensity for stone-free uh, rates with, uh, that were higher with S-wall versus ureteroscopy. And in fact, S-wall showed a 90% stone clearance uh, as opposed to ureteroscopy, which is 80% stone clearance. Now that's not the same for larger stones, stones that were over 10 millimeters, which showed a propensity to have an increase in stone free rates with ureteroscopy uh, versus uh, extracorporeal shockwave. Now since that publication and since the update in 2010, there's been uh, two more systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, one was itch, one in uh, 2012, which looked at seven randomized control trials with approximately 1,200 patients with ureteric stones requiring treatment. <clears throat> and these patients were undergoing extracorporeal shockwave or ureteroscopy. And it suggests that uh, extracorporeal shockwave uh, patients have lower stone free rates and higher retreatment rates uh, than their ureteroscopy counterparts but with the caveat that there was less procedural complications. <clears throat> Again in 2012, uh, a meta-analysis that was performed uh, by uh, Matt Laga's group uh, showed that uh, in terms of patients that were uh, undergoing uh, SPAL versus URS treatment, um, stone or uh, location of stone, uh, patients that were stratified based on location of stones, showed an actual increased propensity of uh, stone-free rates with ureteroscopy uh, versus SWAL for distal stones in this respect. And in fact, there was a greater, there was a 55% greater probability of being stone-free uh, with ureteroscopy. Now in proximal ureteral stones, they also showed that ure ureteroscopy was still superior in uh, getting the patient stone-free. <coughs> and this is listed on, or this is uh, demonstrated in their force plots uh, in which they compared uh, semi-rigid ureteroscopy versus S-wall and the shift right uh, shows an increased propensity to stone free rates for ureteroscopy. <coughs> which leads us to uh, the recommendation made in the guidelines that even though we know uh, the stone-free rates uh, with both SWAL and URS are pretty high, and they're both safe and effect, uh, efficacious treatments based on the available evidence that uh, patients undergoing ureteroscopy have a higher likelihood of achieving stone-free status, uh, especially for distal stones, with uh, the caveat that this is uh, at the expense of a greater risk of complications. And we need to counsel our patients on uh, stone are on both options when available and make the decision uh, with them. Now, if we do decide to do uh, ureteroscopy, how can we met or uh, extracorporeal shockwave? How can we maximize uh, the success of this procedure? Another cat, another scenario would be, um, you know, residents uh, at VGH 1 p.m. Pager goes off again. The eMERGE doc suggests, or it says that he has a guy with an 8 millimeter proximal ureteric stone. He's clinically well. He's been MPO. Coags are normal. Setting everybody up for. <laughs> 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 
can he take a taxi? <laughs> we got it. We, <laughs> we got to clear the emergency boat. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> but Reno will allow one add-on. <laughs> so we we go and we look at the CTKUB and uh, and check the and go and try and uh, find this patient in the emergency department and try and consent them for the procedure. And we look at the CTKUB and we see this. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> we have a situation like this, which is probably becoming more prevalent than, or more, uh, uh, more common now than it was maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, coronal images, of course, of the CT scan showing this proximal ureteric stone. But if you look at the, uh, you can imagine a, an AP length of quite a substantial amount of adipose tissue on this particular patient. Which brings us to uh, one of the main determinants of, <clears throat> or one of the, one of the main determinants uh, affecting asphalt treatment. Uh, which is skin to stone density, <clears throat> or skin to stone distance and sc stone density. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> now, in 2011, uh, uh, Weisenthal <clears throat> Group published a large uh, retrospective Canadian series <clears throat> that included uh, redal, renal and ureteral calculi uh, in patients that were undergoing extracorporeal shock with lithotripsy and <clears throat> monitor them for stone-free rates and saw that uh, when you look at the clinical parameters of BMI and skin-to-stone distance, you actually get an inverse relationship between uh, body mass index and the probability of success of an uh, extraporeal shock rate with the And they can actually create a predictive normogram which shows this inverse relationship or over here on the side. You see that body mass index going up to uh, over 40 to 50 will actually bring your stone-free or your success of an asphalt procedure down from approximately 50% down to about 25%. Um, <clears throat> they suggested in their paper that uh, skin to stone distance of over 11 centimeters and stone density on the CT scan as measured by Hounsfield units of over 900, so dense stones, hard to fracture stones, uh, significantly predicted asphalt failure. Now, in 2009, the Teledol did a res retrospective review of uh, around 1,300 asphalt patients. And again, I uh, noted a skin to stone distance was uh, definitely associated, of over 10, was definitely associated with lower stone free rates. Um, the guidelines then suggest, based on this evidence, that um, <coughs> when deciding on uh, treatment modalities, specifically SWAL, that in order to maximize the success of SWAL, that we need to uh, look at the clinical picture and see if these patients uh, are amenable to a high rate of success of uh, the extracorporeal shock rate of treatment. And that being, uh, are, they, uh, you know, are they suitable for SWAL with skin to stone distances of less than 10 centimeters that have a higher propensity of SWAL success? And do they have stones that are amenable to fracturing with the actual, with the actual uh, uh, ultrasonic uh, uh, lift tripper, which uh, so would indicate that, uh, or sorry, with, which, which is associated with um, lower density stones and not stones, known to be uh, cysteine stones, calcium oxalate monohydrate, and brushite stones. And these stones are, in fact, better treated with ureteroscopy. Now, if we, <clears throat> if we try and optimize uh, S-wall treatment outcomes, there can be a number of different techniques that exist. And uh, several of those techniques are actually listed within the guidelines themselves. I'm not going to go into specific details of each, but um, they offer the uh, options of, or they offer the uh, increasing uh, analysis of uh, optimizing coupling which is uh, a smooth interface between the patient and the uh, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripter. Um, they suggest that uh, uh, it's important to increase, or it's important to have appropriate targeting um, and to readjust that targeting at regular intervals for maximal effect at stone, of stone breakage. 
and that in fact, <clears throat> instead of starting out at a high rate of uh, extracorporeal shock waves dosing, that we do a graded escalation so we don't over um, shock these stones, causing damage to surrounding structures. And that we actually just gradually escal escalate our, our dosing. And that the number of uh, shocks per minute should be approximately 120 shocks or less, mostly going towards 60 to 90 shocks per minute. And that in a single sitting, usually the range, uh, usually the number of shocks that we can uh, deliver are approximately 2,000 to 4,000 shocks. <coughs> Now, what about uh, medical expulsion therapy after S-Wall? Well, <clears throat> this is potentially an area where uh, medical expulsion therapy can really have a benefit. And in a meta-analysis performed in 2010, uh, <clears throat> looked at 15 studies and included 1,300 patients and showed actually with tempsilocin given after extracorporeal shockwave that there was increased benefit of stone clearance rate, approximately 24%. And this was also associated with a shorter expulsion time, lower analgesic requirements, and fewer colic episodes. <coughs> Just recently, another <coughs> uh, systematic review and meta-analysis was performed, including, uh, again, another 1,400 patients. And they looked at uh, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy and medical expulsion therapy, and again confirmed that uh, stone expulsion times were actually improved uh, with an alpha blocker at two weeks. Subsequently, following these patients out one, two, and three months later, you get a decreasing in the rate of uh, benefit of uh, Tamsilos in itself, um, but they did have an improvement at two weeks for stone clearance. And this uh, leads us to this guideline, which suggests that uh, after extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, that alpha blockers should actually be offered to patients with stones um, to help improve stone passage. <clears throat> Specifically now, looking at uh, optimizing ureteroscopy outcomes, when we know we can't do s -wall and we've booked the patient for a URS, <clears throat> now what is the we can ask the question, what's the best mechanism for stone destruction intracorporeally? Now, we don't have any experience with uh, uh, intracorporeal, uh, certainly in the ureter, uh, the use of pneumatic or electrohydraulic uh, stone fracturing, but we use a lot of uh, homium laser. And this has been shown to be superior in virtually all metrics of uh, stone free rates. So, increasing in stone free rates, a decrease in operative time, and less need for auxiliary treatment. And this is shown to be better for larger stones as well, uh, stones that are over 1.5 centimeters. The question always arises whether or not we need a ureteral access sheath. And this has been advocated uh, certainly in ureteral stones and, or certainly in renal stones for several different reasons. Um, the ureteral access sheath allows us to uh, have multiple entry exits uh, into the upper tracts and the collecting system. And it's thought to decrease intrarenal pressure uh, thereby reducing kidney injury. Um, <clears throat> we have an increase in irrigation flow and better visualization. And we can also allow, or it also allows the passive egress of stones or an active retrieval of fragments with baskets uh, after we fracture the stone itself. But the question always arises <coughs> that is the ureteral axis sheath actually causing more harm than good? And in 2002, a study was published uh, uh, on animal models showing that uh, the, the use of a ureteral axis sheath actually caused an increase in transient ureteral ischemia, which caused inflammation, which uh, begs the question of whether or not uh, this is actually doing more harm than good. <coughs> in 2013, um, a Traxxers group actually did a retrospective study of ureteral wall injuries in 46 and in uh, patients undergoing extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy using a, or sorry, a ureteroscopy using a uh, ureteral access sheet. And what they found is actually that uh, in terms of all ureteral trauma, they showed that uh, there was approximately 50% of cases that had a, uh, underwent some kind of ureteral trauma uh, with uh, after the use of a ureteral access sheet. 
and this is graded, urethral trauma is graded from grades one to three. On the left showing a uh, small interval tear or a small uh, disruption in the intima. Uh, into grade two, which is uh, a larger disruption, and three, a full transmural uh, tear through the ureter. And <clears throat> the nice thing about uh, ureteroscopy uh, is that you can visualize this and looking at the ureter coming out, uh, coming down the ureter. And if we do see these, the recommendation is actually to leave a stent for uh, upwards of four weeks uh, to help these uh, traumatic uh, injuries heal. Um, <clears throat> just a quick discussion was made in the uh, paper on uh, stenting, and it was stenting uh, in both clinical situations prior and post ureteroscopy. Now the arguments for stenting uh, pre-ureteroscopy uh, allow us to uh, have passive drainage and ureteral, or sorry, drainage of the uh, collecting system and passive ureteral dilation. But it's been shown that it has no effect on uh, stone-free rates that are uh, in stones that are less than one centimeter, but significantly better in stones that are over one centimeter after a single treatment with a pre-stent. And this I found to be interesting actually from a uh, financial perspective in that stenting prior to a planned ureteroscopy was markedly cheaper than actually not stenting. And this was uh, it's approximately $10,000 cheaper in terms of the overall uh, cost of treatment. And this is mostly thought to be due to uh, the need for less retreatment rates in patients who are stented uh, prior to their planned ureteroscopy. Um, sorry? I've been using the wrong code. <laughs> <laughs> I think these are U.S. numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, like, uh, these are probably up. Like, these are probably cost overall numbers, build, you know, equipment, personnel, and uh, procedural costs. Um, you know, I think it's clouded a little bit in our uh, medical system because we don't see these numbers. But uh, in terms of uh, when you get that bill <laughs> in the states, I think that uh, you can probably be looking at these kind of numbers for a, a, a ureteroscopy and stone treatment. Um, <clears throat> just to finish up, tracks are uh, also in their 2013 paper showed that pre-stenting before. Uh, the use of a ureteral access sheath actually decreased the complication rate by sevenfold. So it's highly recommended uh, if a ureteral access sheath is being used. Is the cost of pre-stenting included in those numbers? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Even the anesthetic and OR time is still yeah. ten grand cheaper. Yeah. Okay. And then the difference is that uh, you really reduce the number. Of, it would be like a third, uh, effectively a third, uh, full operation. For retreatment, if no stent. Um, <clears throat> now, in the post uh, uh, ureteroscopy space, now stents are not always necessary. Now that we do often include stents, and we we put them in uh, for a couple of days after, allowing the patient to remove them themselves. But in uncomplicated uh, ureteroscopy, it's been shown to actually uh, not necessarily be useful at all. It doesn't decrease are the stone free rates or stone passage time. And you can have the same number of complications and uh, urinary tract infections or unplanned medical visits uh, with, a st with a stent in or versus without a stent in. Um, however, the, uh, if we are doing a bilateral ureteroscopy, uh, it is suggested to actually put a stent in, in one side to avoid uh, bilateral ureteric obstruction. Uh, <clears throat> Which leads us to our final uh, guideline I'll touch on today. Uh, the recommendation is that uh, stenting following uncomplicated ureteroscopy, it still remains controversial, but uh, there's evidence to support both sides. And that <clears throat> there's uh, very good evidence to suggest that after the use of a ureteral access sheath, that stents should be, uh, should be placed uh, to help uh, those traumatic injuries that occur in potentially over 50% of the patients that uh, undergo ureteroscopy with a ureteral access sheath uh, to uh, allow those traumatic injuries to heal. Um, <clears throat> the stenting prior to the ureteroscopy itself, 
uh, does show an improvement in stones that are greater than one centimeter. Um, and then it also allows passive dilation of the ureter and better access to the stone itself. Um, <clears throat> so just to touch on some take home points from today, uh, <clears throat> one of the big things is when deciding on a treatment strategy for these patients, we do need to really think about those four uh, factors. We need to consider the stone, the clinical scenario, the anatomical factors that will potentially uh, inhibit or allow us to proceed, and definitely the technical factors. Um, <clears throat> with respect to medical expulsion therapy, I think the paper is strong in certain respects, but um, has a lot of criticisms, and I don't think it justifies the statement that was made at the end of the paper. And uh, to say that we should never look at this uh, topic again, I think is a little premature. Um, certainly, uh, it potentially suggests that medical expulsion therapy can still be used for distal ureteral stones that are greater than five millimeters. Um, <clears throat> ureter uh, with, the with respect to the next point, that uh, ureteroscopy, when intervention is planned, is slightly superior to extracorporeal shockwave, but does carry that higher risk of ureteral injury. And that consideration uh, definitely should be uh, given to placing ureteral stent uh, <clears throat> prior to a perceived difficult ureteroscopy and definitely after a ureteral access sheet, but not necessarily in every patient that has an uncomplicated uh, ureteroscopy and uh, stone removal. And with that, I'll finish up by just acknowledging Dr. Chu, who is a co-author on the paper and uh, helped me with the slides today. Thank you so much.